so yeah, let me welcome everybody again uh, to our tasting series with Blair Guthrie, uh, winemaker extraordinaire. Uh, Blair is telling us a little bit about how he got into the business and uh, really his journey up until now. Yeah. So yeah, I got out of the graphic design industry, um, was trying to figure out what to do. My mom showed me an article in the newspaper to go study viticulture and enology. Um, and I kind of looked at it and thought, oh, well, that could be really fun. It means I'd be outside. I'd get into the, I kind of thought at that point I'd be in the, in the vineyard. I was like, I grew up on a small farm, so agriculture outside would be fun. Um, and then just kind of was like, oh, I'll, I'll go do it. I needed a change in my life. Um, signed up for the, 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 the courses, um, got accepted and packed my bags and moved to the North Island and studied winemaking and viticulture. And within, I would say, I rec the first three days of class, I was just like, this is awesome. Like, I can't believe I never, ever even got into wine before, you know? The most wine I had drunk was probably out of a box hanging from a clothesline or something, you know? Um, it blew my mind. I was just that there's so much involved in it. And I, and I quickly realized that it's a really, actually a really creative industry. Um, it just ended up being another medium for me to be able to create. Um, and I quickly realized I wanted to be in the winemaking side more than the viticulture side. Um, just because I didn't, you know, the, the winemaking, the science and, and the, the, the kind of molding and blending of wine to create this cool final product um, just really got me hooked. Um, I was really lucky. I did, I did. So originally, you know, when I was younger in school, I was really, I was I hated school. I was really bad at it, got bad grades. And it was mainly because I wasn't interested in it. I wasn't passionate about it. I'm a really passionate person. Um, got into enology and viticulture and I loved it. So I was so passionate about it. I was just getting awesome grades. Um, you know, doing really well. I was top of the class for the first time in my life. I was like, what's going on here? Um, it was awesome. And then uh, I was really lucky a, a winery in Australia um, was being built and they had contacted the, the professor and asked if anyone was finishing up the courses that um, they, they would recommend and they put my name forward. Um, so I literally got hired straight out of school um, to, into a winery in Australia and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was for a really young, passionate winemaker that was a uh, you know, making really alternative wines, um, much more natural um, winemaking style and just making wine fun. You know, we were, we had a DJ, we had a record player set up at the winery. We had, we were cooking dinner every night at the winery and eating amazing food and drinking awesome wine. It was awesome. Um, and then I, I did that in Australia for a few years and I came to the US. Um, I did an internship for Paul Hobbs, which is a, famous Cabernet grower, uh, grower and winemaker here in, in Sonoma and Napa. Um, and I met my now wife. She was also doing the same thing, interning at the winery. Um, and Bob's your uncle, I got stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> and how long after you started at Paul Hobbs did it ultimately take you, I guess, to get married and then get involved in the family business? It's yeah, great. so... 2009, I came from my internship, and then I, I met Caroline, both working at Hobbs, and I went back to my job in Australia briefly for another 18 months, and well, two years, and then we immigrated in, in 2011 back to the US. So I got here in 2011, I briefly went back to work for Paul Hobbs again, um, and then um, got a full-time job at Cundy Estate Winery in Sonoma. So it's a really big fifth generation um, estate, um, all kind of run by the family. Family's really involved. And I got kind of hired to help revive the, um, the fine wine program portion of it, um, which was really exciting. Um, it was kind of fake it until you make it. Uh, everything before that, it was small boutique winemaking in Australia. Um, I was really lucky in Australia. He, he was an open book and he taught me a huge amount. Um, and I, I knew what I needed to do from going from school to working in Australia that I, I knew how to do everything. And so when I got to the US, I kind of just said, yeah, I can do that. No problem. No worries. You know, I went from making three, crushing 300 tons to 3000 tons. What, um, is, what is that adjustment like? like? When you go from such 
different kind of scales of magnitude. Yeah. Uh, what, what were some of the challenges that you really faced? Logistics. You have to be, re- if you want to be a serious winemaker and make, a, and you know, and do anything other than a really small boutique brand, which is very difficult to, to sustain, you really need to be able to multitask, um, be really good at logistics. Um, and you've got, I think I had fermenting, I think I had 600 different lots of wine that I was tracking for fermentation um, and to make sure all of the, everything that happens to that, you know, it's, and it's a lot of money in those tanks. When you fill up a tank full of grapes, it's a lot of money and you can't let that go bad. You can't screw that up. So it's stressful for sure. Um, I think the, a lot of people on the outside think of winemaking as being really relaxed and we're all just kind of sipping wine and eating cheese. Um, it's actually, I find it really stressful at times because you can't screw up at the end of the day. It's not like beer where you, you, you make a bad batch, you dump it and you make it again. With wine, we have one shot every year to get it right. Um, and the good winemakers, I think, have really high expectations of themselves and don't let it, anything slip. And I think that's the key, you know, and just really being really dedicated, dedicated to it. You've got to live and breathe it. And it's the same on your side, Will, when you're in the sommelier side, you know, you've got to live and breathe it to be, to be the best. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I want to get to one of the questions that was submitted via the Q&A uh, from Mikey Mayers. Uh, since we have been talking about your journey uh, into winemaking, uh, the question is, what would you recommend to someone who wants to get into viticulture and winemaking? Um, go and work a harvest as an intern first. I think. Um, because is, that, is that as a warning or... Yeah, <laughs> it's a hard, we, 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 we're, we're glorified farmers, right? Um, and farming is a hard business. Um, it, it's long hours and it's, it, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm sound, making it sound like it's not amazing. It's an awesome lifestyle and I love it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else, but it's hard and it takes, you have to be dedicated to your craft to climb the ladder. Um, but I would say you, you want to go and do a harvest. So you want to go and try and get a harvest intern job at a, at a, for a vineyard management company or for an estate or get a, a intern internship at a winery for harvest. And you get to kind of see what it takes to make wine during harvest. And you're usually working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and you get a day off to wash your clothes and cook some food for the week. And then you're back on the next day. Um, but it's fun. I mean, I love it. I'm, I just, it, when harvest starts rolling around, I get so pumped. I'm just like, yes, it's harvest, right? It's a rush, right? Yeah, it sounds a, not like restaurant work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think if you have a competitive streak, like you're, you're, you'll do well in the wine industry, you know, like it's, it's, it is, it's almost like a game sometimes, you know, it's really fun. Uh, question, uh, again, if any of you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've got a lot of amazing questions already coming in. Uh, I will get to all of them. I might not go in order, so bear with me. Uh, Christine Ticker asked, is there a New Zealand influence in your winemaking here in California? Um, a little bit. Um, most of my influence actually is, probably comes from South Australia where I was working because um, he's really what he was, the winemaker I worked for was so passionate that he really influenced a lot of the way I think. Um, but I would say the New Zealand part of it definitely, like I really enjoy those really mineral driven bright um acid driven um crisp white wines that we get out in new zealand like i would say i definitely bring that over here i make a savion blanc for new for stewart sellers and i and i it is a california savion blanc but i definitely try and put that new zealand twist on it because i love that kind of like kind of um that greener herbal kind of crisp savion blanc style and mix it with a little bit of that california sunshine yeah for sure um this will be a good transition into talking about all the different projects that you work on. Uh, from Megan Parker, how do you decide which ones to release under your different labels, Guthrie versus Stewart, et cetera? Yeah, so they all, each brand has its own kind of direction. And so all the wine from grape, when I buy those grapes or I contract the grapes with the farmer or I grow them, we're, I've been, I already have those allocated and with an intention of them to go into each brand. So whereas Stuart Sellers is really, um, it's more of a Bordeaux Cabernet focused brand. And so, you know, I wouldn't make Picpoul Blanc for Stuart Sellers. 
Um, it's just not what that brain is about. Um, versus, you know, for Guthrie, I'm, I'm searching for more of those cool um, Roan varieties that are really hard to find that we don't have a lot of on the shelf. Um, and then when it comes to blending and things, I'm, I'm, I'm taking, I might have a, a, a variety of wines in the winery. I, I, I already kind of know I will probably want to put this, this section of wines over here for Stuart. I want to put this section here for Slingshot. I want to put this section here for Guthrie. Yeah. And you and I have talked about this a lot, but the, the switch that has to happen as a creative person to go from making Peak Pool Bon yeah. to making Las Piedras Vineyard, Beckstoffer Fruit, trying to be a 100-point Cabernet. Right. That's a, that's a wild swing that I think a lot of people would really struggle with. How do you do it? You got to – you got to – you got you. You got to take. You got to put your pit bull hat on when you're making pit bull. You got to take it off and leave all of that, that way of thinking out, and then put your your tokel on or, or your Robert Parker hat on, on when you start doing the big cabs. Um, I, I'm just. I think I'm. I'm really. I'm a really creative person, and I, I really love doing every. You know, I'm like got that artist mentality where I don't want to just do one thing. I want to do everything and create all these different things, and so I find it easy to be able to like do pick pull blanc and when i'm done with that i turn my brain off and i go over here and i switch on my cabernet brain and i get into my cab um i'm really lucky that i've worked for a, a variety of kind of winemakers and a variety of wineries where i've i've been able to learn how to make fresh aromatic cool climate wines i've you know i worked for you know that was in australia and then worked for paul when he's all about this big robert parker um, Cabernets and big Pinots and things. Um, so I'm lucky, you know, a lot of people and it's not intentional for a lot of people, but they kind of, you get into the industry and you choose, you know, Pinot and Chardonnay and you go and work for that winery and then you leave there and you go to another Pinot and Chard winery. And then that's after, next thing you know, you've been in the industry for 10 years and all you know is Pinot and Chard. Um, I've been really lucky that I've managed to work for a variety of people and pick up everything. From all these guys and I, I mean i ask i mean most winemakers get sick of talking to me because all i'm doing is asking questions, <laughs> asking questions asking questions how do you do that why do you do this to try i just you got absorb 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 yeah well let's talk a little bit about the wine that we're drinking uh we've got a lot of questions flooding in please continue to submit questions via the q a um so we're drinking the peak pool blanc uh and I think what's the good intro question? We'll go to Katie Atkinson's question. Again, I will get to all of them just in a really weird order, so bear with us. Uh, Peak pool mostly grows in France. How does growing it in California differ from similar French wines? Yeah. So I guess in other French varieties that we grow here. Yeah, so how does it grow differently to in California compared to France? Or Yeah, yeah I guess so. In, in France, it's usually... You know, my particular pickle block, I'm really lucky. So in France, it's usually kind of grown on the mount on the hillsides and in the mountains and on limestone soils. I'm really lucky this vineyard. I'm up in the mountains. I'm 2,000 feet elevation and I'm growing on limestone. Um, so I'm literally, I feel like I'm in a French terroir for this. I got really lucky um, that it wasn't planted down in the flat somewhere in a clay soil yeah. and it made a really broad fat wine. Um, I've been able, I was up, it's, it's slate and limestone soil. It's 2000 feet of elevation. It just gets ripe every year because it's so cold. Um, so I'm able to really make a, although I, I never ever try to make French wine. I use it as inspiration. I really have made like a Frenchy kind of mineral acid driven pickle blanc, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's, it's like, Perfect. I couldn't have asked for more for that vineyard um, and that variety planted in that vineyard. Um, well, a lot of a lot of people don't know. Like California doesn't have a lot of limestone. Uh, yeah, it's really weird. Uh, it was like when I found that, <laughs> I was just like, hallelujah! You know, you <laughs> not a lot of limestone around, and so they have Picpoul Blanc planted on limestone. Yeah, it's it's like a needle in a haystack. Yeah, and that that kind of goes to another question that we had come in from Minoski, Vinoski, Vinoski. All of them sound good. Uh, any reason why this tastes like a European white? Uh, and I think, not to answer for you, but I think that goes back to the site. 
the fact yeah. that it's high elevation plant taste, the fact that it's on limestone, the fact that it's a cool climate. Like when you compare a lot of growing regions in the old world to the new world, classically stuff in the new world is going to be warmer. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the same climate uh, makeups. Uh, so a lot of the grapes are grown to a more ripe state yeah. uh, when they're harvested. Whereas, you know, in, in France, typically peak cool is going to be. It rains. Again, you, right. And you're going to, it's going to be linear. Uh, you know, somebody asked about food pairings for peak pool. I always think like bouillabaisse because, you know, Southern France with classic seafood of Southern France and oysters and stuff like that. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment of why yeah. this might? I mean, a big part of the wine is the terroir. Um, you know, it's, it's a very Frenchy terroir. Um, <laughs> But and I I also make my Guthrie family wines are also kind of made in a more of a European style. I take an old world approach to Guthrie family wines, and so I'm picking much earlier. The reason a lot a big part of the reason California wine looks California is because it gets so ripe. We can't turn off the sunshine, you know. And and let let's just use France as an example. They're usually picking because they have to pick, because the weather is finishing it. It's you know they're in the harvest and the weather's closing in and it's about to start raining and it's not gonna stop for a month. So they, they have to pick. And so they're picking at really low sugars, low alcohol, high acid. So I kind of take that same approach here. I could leave this, these grapes on the vine for two weeks longer, generally, probably. <laughs> um, but it would create the bigger, more California style. And I don't, that's not what I want in, in my white wine, especially. So I pick it early. I'm picking it at 20 bricks to 21 bricks, which is, really low. So like, you know, it's 11 and a half, 12% alcohol. So that also helps kind of give it that European character. Um, and then I do, I do old world winemaking on it. You know, I don't do, I don't manipulate it. Um, it comes into the winery. It's natural fermentation for sugars and, and acids. I don't put any oak on it. Um, it's, it just goes in and I, and ferments naturally. And then when it's done, I let it settle out and I put it in the bottle that you you started to touch on a couple of people were asking uh they they just really want to know more about this wine because of how damn good it is um you know i know somebody asked for tasting notes i, I always tell people tasting notes like whatever you're whatever you're finding but it goes to another question that somebody asked uh, how would you personally describe this wine because a lot of people struggle when they, they taste a wine that they really really like yeah when they go to a store they go to a restaurant and someone asks, well, what do you normally drink? And they don't really know how to describe what they enjoy. Right. I would personally, for this wine specifically, I would say if, the, if you like this wine, that you might find yourself gravitating towards like really bright, crisp, mineral driven white wines. Yeah. Uh, because that's really how I would like slot this wine if I had to slot it. Really this very bright on the nose and really bright on the palate. Um, it's quite light, you know, so it's lower, it's lower in alcohol. So it's quite light on the palate. It's not going to be kind of heavy and spicy from the alcohol. Um, it's really acid driven. So you've got this great kind of minerality through the palate. Um, it's got a briny kind of um, citric acid character to it. Um, and then once it opens up and the wine warms up, it, it's, it's, it's strange. It's actually now starting to get stone fruit. Mm. Which you don't usually get in Picpoul Blanc. You know, Picpoul Blanc is usually all this kind of minerality and like wet stone and slate and kind of crushed gravel. Um, and it's good. But now after being in bottle for a year, it's kind of opening up and you get this like, it's almost like underripe um, stone fruit. So like white peach, that's like you pick it off the tree when it's still rock hard. And you, I don't know if anyone's ever had that opportunity. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pick it off the tree like way too early and you kind of bite into it and it's really acidic but it still has like that stone fruit flavor um someone someone here asked how how did you find this vineyard and, and really a lot of the vineyards that you work with uh correct me around this is rorick heritage vineyard right yeah this is rorick uh, matthew rorick so he has forlorn hope so a lot of the wines i actually make um i i quite often with, will will buy a wine drink it and go, man, that's amazing. And I'll start researching, can I get the same fruit? Um, so that's what happened with this is I, I bought um, Forlorn Hope makes, um, a, he doesn't do a still Picpoul Blanc out of it every year, but he makes a sparkling Picpoul Blanc out of it sometimes. Um, and I, I, I bought it, tasted it, I was like, blew my, blew my mind. And I was like, I need this fruit. Uh, I called him up, 
I think two days later and, and he was like, you're lucky. I got a couple of tons. For you. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, how, that's a lot of the time how I'll, I will pick vineyards. That's kind of my first way of doing it. And then the second way is, is just talking in within my, my peers and other winemakers who are using the same vineyard taste, maybe going and tasting their barrels and being like, wow, this is good. Um, and then, and kind of then going checking out vineyards and if it looks the way, that I need from my style of wine making, I'll, I'll usually sign it up. How, how would you decide to use neutral barrel or even new French, new American on white wine specifically? Like, is there a style that you would make for Guthrie family wines that might call for, you know, more use of oak barrel, whether new or old? Right. So I think for, for Guthrie family wines, I'm really going for purity of fruit and freshness. And so I, I, I used to use new oak on the reds and I even used, I used to make a Chardonnay for Guthrie a few years back. I used a little bit of oak on that. Um, but I've really found over the years that I'm trying to get, I really liked the, the barrels that were old oak that didn't have any influence of, of oak on them. And they were just really fresh and really pure and bright. And so that's kind of where I've, I've pushed the Guthrie family wines brands to is like making these beautiful bright wines um, that just are, are fresh and, you want to like open a bottle and sit by the pool. Yeah. Um, when it comes to oak and white wines, you know, I think that more, that's more into Stuart Cellars. Stuart Cellars are bigger wines. They're, they've got more texture. They're a little weightier. Um, so like on the Chardonnay for Stuart Cellars, I, I put about 28% new oak on that to kind of just give it some more oomph and texture. You know, but the style of winemaking for that brand is a, is a bigger style. Um, so it's not yeah. as acid driven. So when a wine's at really acid driven, it just doesn't work well with oak. You know, the, it, it, yeah. it, it's, it, it, it's disjointed. It sticks out. You know, when, you, when your wines are a bit bigger and rounder, I feel like it works so much better. It integrates more. And uh, when you're talking about wines that are a little bit leaner like this, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about food pairing, but a couple more questions came in about food pairing specifically. I talked about bouillon base. I talked about oysters. Uh, what do you want to eat with this? I think really cheese is a mess. A big mm. spread of cheese plate would be great. Um, I think because when you've got acidic white wines, um, the fat of the cheese really cuts through them and makes them really f plush and, and fattens the wines out. Um, traditionally, usually, I think in France, traditionally, you only have uh, cheese with white wine as well, right? You're not meant to yeah. have it with red, right? Um, I would also eat, I, this is like pizza. And have a pizza. Yeah. I think uh, the exception on that is like a poisson in Burgundy. You would have it with Pinot Noir, but that's about it. But I think um, like a white pizza. Yeah, dude. Like a, this to me is like New Haven clam, like clam pizza. Yeah. Would be. I mean, the absolute people love it. It's oyster wine, right? That's what everyone yeah. is. Like a dozen oysters, a white pizza, and a bottle of Pickle Blanc. Drive up to Hog Island in Tamales Bay and just right. drink oh. like 30 or 40 of these. And eat about four hundred oysters. Totally, sounds about perfect. If you go to New York, uh, take a bottle of pickle bone and get some fish. Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, we've got a a lot of questions to still get to, so I want to make sure that uh, I get to all yeah. of them. Um, let's talk about briefly. Uh, someone asked where your wife is from, but she's a she's a steward originally, so she's from here. She's from here. She's American. She's from Texas. Houston, Texas, originally. From Tejas. All Texas. right. Um, somebody asked why why you guys came back here. Um, which yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> so love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so we were kind of, we, we we were deciding what we were going to do, and we were like, we could uh, as a New Zealand citizen, we I'm legally allowed to live in Australia with no there's there's no visas required or immigration or anything you just go live there so we could have either lived in new zealand australia or the us obviously so we we're just kind of thinking like new zealand is a beautiful country um i just had really big aspirations and really big goals for the wine industry and it's hard to do that in new zealand it's still very much a winemaking in new zealand is still very much a lifestyle and the reality is that you have to export 80% of your product to make a living. Um, there's only four and a half million people in New Zealand. I think there's four and a half million people just in the Bay Area uh, to, to make, you know, just to make an economic sense of it, right? So like 
I had had to sell my product to all of New Zealand to, to just like make a sustaining business versus I could probably just sell my product maybe only in California and probably still be able to make a, a living. Um, so there was that side of things. Um, we didn't want to live in Australia. I loved, loved working there. I just never could live in Australia. Um, don't get me started. Um, so we kind of just, and, and Caroline, <laughs> Caroline's, um, Caroline's uh, brother had already got into the wine industry a little bit here. Um, her dad had started a small hobby brand in the early 2000s, which is now Stuart Sellers. Um, and so we just, and Caroline's brother had sort of got involved in that and started to kind of work on figuring out how to build that a little bit bigger. And so then Caroline got involved and then I got involved. And so we kind of thought, we'll come back to the US, we've already got a foothold. We could take this small little hobby brand and, 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 and turn it into something substantial. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, jumping back to the, to the wine, we, we got a couple questions come in. Um, yeah, somebody asking where Peepo comes from. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but Peepo is originally from southern France, uh, around the Languedoc. Um, you can actually have people in uh, Chateau to Pop Blanc as well, uh, which is fun. Um, let's see, there's another question. Oh, what kind of, uh, somebody asked, what's wrong with Australia? I swear, we'll cover that. Um, but <laughs> what kind of glass would you recommend bringing this out of? And this is actually a question that I get a lot. People ask you about glassware because, you know, they're, you might go to a restaurant and order two bottles of wine, you get different glassware for each. I'm a big proponent of just drink your wine out of whatever you have yeah. handy. Uh, but is there something specific that you think is best? It used to be a real glass stickler. You know, I went to a few <laughs> glass seminars and we drank a variety of different wines out of the correct glasses. And it, dis, it does make a huge difference. You know, if you drink Chardonnay out of the wrong glass, it, it changes the wine drastically. But the more and more I've like, over the years, I've just kind of like, just, just put it in like, I, I think there's two glasses you need. You need a burgundy glass and a Bordeaux glass, basically. You yeah. can put everything into those two glasses. Yeah. You know, I, and so for me, most and no, of no I, champagne stems. I never use a champagne stem. Yeah. Fuck yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think most red wines um, that are heavier reds can go into a Bordeaux glass, even like a, GS, a Syrah or a GSM. And then any white, most white wines and lighter reds i put in a burgundy glass yeah and so burgundy glass is the short squatty one and a bordeaux glass is the taller skinny one so this is a this is a burgundy glass that i'm drinking out of kind of sticking with not the glass theme but general uh kind of bringing things back to the wine uh christine tinker asked what drew me to guthrie wines for the wines for portfolio and actually uh you guys were part of the portfolio before i joined the team but what continues to draw me to your wines and why I would have been seeking them out anyways is a wine like this because, you know, when you're building a portfolio of domestic wineries, you need to have amazing Chardonnay. Uh, you need to have crisp, delicious California fruit forward, stone fruit, tropical fruit, Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, you need cabs, you need Pinots, you need Zins, you need all these things. Uh, but you also need to like truly spread the word about what's coming and what, what, what else is happening behind, uh, behind maybe the, the supermarket doors and stuff like this, you know, yeah. stuff like people, stuff like Carbonic Carignan and, and Carbonic Syrah and Bennett Valley Syrah. Like uh, what it, you're it, working on is exploring California in a way that I want our members to explore California. For sure. And, and there's so much opportunity for like alternative alternative varieties. You know, we call them alternative varieties here, but they're not around the rest of the world. I think it's 90, yeah. 93% of California's grown to like four great, five grape varieties. You know, it's ridiculous. And so, um, and we need those wines, but unfortunately I think like the big, big corporate wine has really pushed Cab and Chardonnay and Pinot and, and, and Zin. Um, and there's nothing wrong with those wines, but like, once you've had those, it's kind of like, when you get into wine, it's kind of like, you drink those wines, like, great, okay, what else is there? Like, you want to yeah. keep exploring. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of great varieties. So, you know, why not, uh, why not yeah. drink more? Um, that's what Guthrie is about. Like, I don't really, I'm, you know, I don't want to 
do the mainstream varieties. I want to get everything that's fun and creative. Um, you know, I just working with a grower. I just signed a con contract this morning to, to graft. There's a small Pinot vineyard up in the mountain and I'm getting him to graft over with Grenache Blanc because there's just not enough of it. Mm. An amazing variety. And I do, and Guthrie's all run variety. So if it's, if it's great. I love it. Yeah. Um, let's see. We're talking about the, yeah. or the texture. The... Yeah. I was going to say, uh, somebody really asked for a little bit more about the wine, just in terms of like, uh, we've talked a lot about the origins of the grape. We talked a lot about the winemaking. Um, but when you're crap, when you have a wine like this, that look, let, let's be honest, even when people is at its best coming out of France, it's usually a pretty simple wine. Yeah. And even if you're making a wine that is meant to be drink communally and drink by poolside, like if you have the choice, you're going to want a wine with complexity. Yeah. So you could out of a relatively simple, generally great. Right. So you have to say that again, mate. You cut out real quick at the back. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to wonder how do you coax complexity out of a grape like peak pool that a lot of times it's a little bit more of a simple grape? Yeah, I think that it's, it's, I don't think it's that the grape itself is a simple grape. You know, every grape I think has the, has the chance of being very complex. It's, it's, it's the style of the winemaker. And so in France, it's always been kind of a, a really affordable white wine in France, right? And so it's always been made in a simple kind of mentality where, you know, it's a, it's a cheaper wine. So the people drinking it must not be very smart, you know, kind of, kind of attitude. So I think just taking it and treating it really seriously and trying to make a serious wine out of it. Um, and then I, I like my wine, you know, I think being textured, like this is a lot of texture on the palate. I think that really creates a huge amount of kind of depth and, and complexity to, to a wine. It's just by just be creating some texture on it. Um, so I, I do some like, I stir the, the barrels a little bit in the winery just to kind of create texture on the palate, which, which slows the wine down and it keeps it in your mouth for longer and kind of lets you think about it a little bit more. Um, I think the acid helps a lot being, making it a bit more of a thinker. Um, I always, I'm always trying to make, so with the Guthrie wines, I want them to be really drinkable, right? Like I want you to, to be able to turn your brain off, but I don't want them to be simple. So it's this real, it's, it's actually quite tricky as a winemaker. I'm trying to make these just super glue glue crushable wines, but at the same time, not making them simple. I still want the complexity there in the background. And um, so it's just, just it's, and it's, so it's minor little things. It's just a small amount of texture. It's just tweaks with the acidity and things like that. Um, native fermentation, I think, goes a long way. Um, native fermentation yeah. helps a lot to add layers and complexity to the wine. And so when we have a native fermentation in it, so versus um, you, we can buy commercial yeast strains. And when we inoculate our wine, we know that that one commercial yeast strain is fermenting that wine. When we have a native fermentation, we can usually have 20 to 80 or 20 to 50 strains of yeast in that fermentation going at once. And so it's just creating all these different layers because all these different yeasts are doing different things. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Love it. Um, we've got a couple of <laughs> general questions for you. Matt is just out here, just absolutely vulgar language in the Q and A. I apologize. Um, all right, what are what are some, some of the goals in your winemaking? I, I guess specifically with Guthrie family wines, like you, you talked about working with Grenache Blanc in the future, but what are some of the goals that you want for the brand? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really trying to be sustainability, eco-friendly, um, clean, healthy is, is a huge goal for what I'm doing with Guthrie. I'm really, I think the agriculture has really screwed up the world. Um, um, so I'm trying... I'm this, this harvest, I'll be a hundred percent made from organic grapes. Um, so really being pushing for that. I really think it's now or never to, to transfer everything to organic. Everybody needs to do it. Agriculture is a dirty industry and we need to stop um, poisoning our rivers and streams and, and, you know, people that live in agricultural um, areas of the country have huge higher rates of cancer and things like that. So 
Um, it's a big goal of mine to start transferring in, not even with Guthrie, actually, everything I do, I, I'm trying to go into organic vineyards. Um, it's tricky because in the US, it's such a small amount of agriculture is organic, um, but that's really changing a lot. Um, so I'm pushing for that, it's a big goal. Um, and then in the winery, they're kind of taking the same mentality where I'm trying to be responsible and clean in the winery um, and not add 50 ingredients into my wine to make it, you know, palatable. Um, you know, like it's, it's not necessarily that, that any additions that can be made in the winery are really that bad for you. It's, it's more of a, a, an impact on the earth that I worry about. You know, if we don't need to do it, let's not do it. Um, everything comes with a cost. Um, you know, yeah. even if it's, even if it's yeast, right? Like inoculating your tank with yeast, it, it's not that that's unhealthy or bad for the wine, but we have to create these big giant labs, commercial labs that can create all this lit yeast and then it gets shipped all around the world just so we can put it in our wine. And so just trying to cut back on everything as much as possible. Um, and, you know, I want, you know, I want there to be a, a, a beautiful vineyard with a lake on it that my kids can swim in and it not be poisoned. Um, so that, um, and then, I'm, you know, I'm, I really, I love Rhone varieties. And so Guthrie Family Wines is now completely 100% Rhone varieties. Um, and I'll keep it that way. Um, the goal with Guthrie, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, Will, but I'm going through the alphabet with my wines. Yeah. You, you knew that? Okay. So the well, goal. I didn't the, know it. You you told me. I told you. <laughs> so I may I want to make the whole alphabet of wines, right? So that's so every wine that I make has its own label and its own name, and so each each name represents a letter of the alphabet. And so the goal is to get through the whole alphabet, not all at once. Some of the wines will disappear and come back and disappear, but yeah. So the Pickle Blanc is called Faux, so that's F. Uh, you. I, we've had a couple of questions about the labels and the names. Um, so how did the faux leopard get, or is it a jaguar? I can't remember. Your daughter drew it, right? Yeah. My daughter okay. would kill you if she called you call it a leopard. Okay. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, and then how, do you do some of the graphic design on the labels as well? Somebody asked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. A lot. I'm pretty involved because I was a graphic designer and an artist. It's something I really love to do. Um, so, you know, the, the Pickle Blanc label, I drew it all up by hand on paper and then I send it to my graphic. I have a graphic designer that, that will basically turn it into a label for me. So I, I, I really design everything on my labels. Um, bar the electric Syrah, I got an artist out of London to do that one for me. Um, and then I've, I've got a new Grenache. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a Grenache this harvest and I've got a new Grenache label that I got a, an artist out of Indonesia actually to, to do for me. Um, but, um, I, I, from all the wines, uh, for me have their own personality and I want to give them their own label to reflect that personality. Um, and so I'm going through the alphabet and just trying to come up with a name for each one that and, and the names don't necessarily mean anything and related to the wine, but the name will be something usually that reflects like a time and place I was when I came up with that wine or, 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 or idea to make that wine or something. So um, faux was because of fake news. That's where that came from. Um, the jaguar is because it was my daughter's favorite animal and she was, I couldn't come up with an idea and she was like, why don't you put a jaguar on there? So I put a Jaguar on there. It's amazing. I mean, it's not very complex. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it's endearing. Uh, none of your, none of your wines have um, foil on them. Uh, no. It's a waste of is exposed. Yep. So I just kind of, we don't need it. Um, it's foils are made, are actually pretty bad for the environment. Um, a lot of them are made out of tin and tin mining is really dirty. We don't even do it in, in the US. It actually all comes from, I think they get it from Portugal because they don't allow to mine it prop in the US or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a dirty industry. So it's just another thing that I can, if I can eliminate it, I eliminate it. Um, they used to put foils on wines way back in the day to stop beetles and things getting into the corks. But we don't really have yeah. that now because we have you know clean warehouses and things like that. 
So they're just kind of pointless for me. Just get rid of it. Um, and I think it looks, it looks cleaner and fresher and a little more simple. Um, you'll notice the corks as well um, are, are these, these corks are actually made out of um, sugar cane. Um, so they're a byproduct of actually of the fossil of um, the biofuel industry. So they, they, they get sugar cane and they use it to make biofuel. And then they use all of the cork that's left, uh, the, the cane that's left over to make these corks. So it actually has a negative carbon footprint on it. Um, so it's really cool. A lot of people kind of think, oh, is it like he's got a plastic cork in there? Like it's weird that he has like a cheap cork, but a lot of uh, us new younger winemakers are using them. They're really awesome. They breathe like a natural cork, um, but they're made from sugar cane and uh, you can compost it. It's completely compostable. Um, Does that, do those also mitigate TCA risk? Yeah, zero TCA. Yeah. So that was a, another thing I, I, I don't use cork for is that it's like one of the few products that you buy and they openly tell you that some of it's going to ruin your wine. <laughs> you know, it's, and, and there's nothing worse than you being like waiting for a bottle or you've been holding onto a bottle and you open it and it's, and it's corked and damaged and it tastes like wet cardboard or something. Um, so I, I, I kind of gave up on natural cork for gut here. So especially with my wines are really light and, and fresh and bright. And so and, and cork just wasn't cutting it to keep the wines really fresh and bright um, for, for the style of winemaking. They, they work fine in Stuart Cellars, these bigger, heavier wines, and they can kind of handle the, the oxygen impact from it. But for, for what I was doing, it wasn't working. Uh, we've got about 15 questions left, and we've got about 12 minutes. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to speed through some of these, um, but how many, about how many growers do you partner with? And uh, I guess how many different vineyards do you partner with per vintage specifically? Right. So different growers are probably with um, one, two, three, four, six, I would say about 15 different growers and that spreads out over about 22 different vineyards. Um, and then this year, so I have a new project that I'm working on for another company, um, to be their winemaker that might turn into, um, about 50 or 60. Um, so it could be pretty fun. It's going to be, it's going to be an interesting harvest. I'm going to be doing a lot of driving and my vineyards go all the way from Lake County, Mendocino County, Sonoma County, Napa Valley. Um, Calveras, which is way out in the mountains and Sierra Foothill Mountains. So I do a lot of driving everywhere. Um, but that's kind of what I need to do to get the grapes that I want. You know, I could get it all probably from one little pocket, but I feel like the wines would be really similar and kind of boring, not as interesting. Uh, if you want to make fun, cool wines that people are into, you gotta, you gotta travel to, to get those. Yeah, grapes. For it. yeah the Picpoul Blanc is, is in the Sierra Foothills. All the way, all, like all the way over, um, on the way to Yosemite. Um, it's it's you know it takes me I think it takes me three hours to get there from here. Um, and then I have all the stuff dotted around me and seen as well. Uh, have you ever played FMK? Uh, FMK. Marry and kill, or the M and the K. Uh, yeah, right. I <laughs> guess so I think so. so. So for the purposes of this chat, we'll call it Screw, Mary Kill. Uh, somebody asked, uh, FMK, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pick, Pool, and Grinch. So if I have to, what, screw one of them? You screw one of them, marry one of them, kill one of them. Kill Cabernet. I knew that was coming. Uh, marry, I could marry Pick, Pool, Blanc. And then what's my other option? Good life. Uh, uh, one night of, of a oh, flight. One night stand. Where, uh, that's probably got to be it's like... Grenache. Grenache. Because it's... Gr yeah, it's Grenache people look at. All right, I dig it. Grenache. Uh, and then... I'm glad there wasn't humans involved in that. No, that would have gotten really awkward very quickly. Um, so let's... I want to... We've got a lot of uh, big picture questions, but I want to grab a couple more that are specific before the end. Uh, we'll answer the big picture ones too, I promise. Um, are there, do you work with any growers in Oregon for the coastal grapes similar to New Zealand? Uh, do, you, do, you wanna, do you want to work with Oregon grapes at a certain point? I think I'd love to um, once I can hire a full-time assistant. 
I would love to get out there. It's just, it's, just, it's a little far logistically, logistic wise to, to get be getting fruit from there for me. My friend Joel at Las Harris Wines gets some Pinot from up there that he brings down here. So it's, it's doable. Um, let's do, is it hard being in business with your wife's family? Oh yeah. <laughs> Very difficult. Family businesses are, are not easy and the wine industry is not easy. Um, so you, get, you combine those together, it gets pretty stressful. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, this is on the subject of corking the wine. Uh, being from New Zealand, why do you continue to cork the wine? Uh, why don't you just move to Stelden? Yeah. Um, I ask my questions. I ask myself the same question quite often. I, unfortunately, the... Um, I think maybe for Guthrie Family Wines, I could probably get away with going to Stelvin, cap, screw cap. Um, but the American market's just not into it. It's yeah. considered, you know, if you talk to distributors around the country, the people, the gatekeepers that are buying these wines to go to stores and restaurants, they still consider screw cap as a cheap option, yeah. um, which is not. Um, it's just kind of, for some reason here in the US, cork is considered high end. Um, so that's probably the main reason I haven't done it. Um, and I, I, I just, I've had some friends back home who went from cork, they went to screw caps and they've gone back to cork. Um, and so I need to talk to them about why they did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to mix it up here. How accurate is Flight of the Concords? Very, very, very <laughs> accurate. Um, You're very dry you had, with humor and acting. <laughs> if you had to briefly sum up like the major differences between growing grapes in New Zealand, Australia, and uh, the US, how would you describe them? Yeah, I would say in New Zealand, um, it's really difficult to grow grapes because of our climate. Um, everything wants to get mold and fungi growing on it. Um, in New Zealand, it's still a lifestyle. You're still just a cruisy old farmer. Um, in Australia, it's a little bit more of a rip shit and bust attitude, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> how much money can I squeeze out of this? You know, who cares about the quality? Sometimes I felt like it was a little bit like that. Um, and then I would say here in the US, it is, it is serious business. It is, um, it is serious, serious business here. There's a lot of money involved and there's a lot of big money involved in it, and, and people don't muck around. There are lot, when you buy grapes, it's a lock and sealed contract, and yeah, you, know, you know, and it's you know. unless your last name is Wagner. Yeah, um, <laughs> oh. uh, we've got let's see a couple of general questions, and then we'll finish up with the big picture questions. Uh, any recommended wine content to follow? Books, podcasts, websites, magazines. Um, I mean, I think the wine, the the Atlas, World Atlas of Wine is my favorite wine book. I'm yeah. very visual with uh and if you like to travel it's kind of like traveling to all these places the crew podcast is really good the ticket to the palette podcast say, crew, crew is a really um, good podcast i think he, he crew and another one is the winemakers um mm. the reason i like those two guys is uh, the winemakers and crew is that they're actually out here in wine country and so they're talking directly with us um and getting kind of the inside scoop on on winemaking yeah uh, if you could only pick one bottle of wine to drink for the rest of your life, what would it be and where is it from? It cannot be from your own supply. A, a particular bottle? Uh, yeah. Meh. I wouldn't. It doesn't I, sound if, fun. If I had to pick a variety, it would be Syrah. I just find it really fun and interesting and very diverse as a grape. But a particular bottle? Psh, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not like that. I, I'm too, I, I rarely drink the same bottle twice. I, yeah. I I always buy a different wine. It's, unless it blows my blows me away, I'll buy I'll buy a, a case of it. But I I try to drink a different wine every time I open something. My answer would just be champagne. If I could drink champagne for the rest of my life, I'd be yeah. pretty happy. I I probably do. Uh, I'm I'm actually a, I'm actually a, a Dom Perignon. I know it's not cool to say, but vintage Dom Perignon, I would drink that all day long. Hey man, O2 Dom is pretty pretty freaking good. Mm -hmm. um, how how important are like 
distribution channels for you or uh, selling directly to restaurants, et cetera? It's pretty, pretty big. So, you know, as a whole, everything I do for, for the four different brands, you know, most of our wine is sold through distribution into restaurants. And so right now we're 80% down on sales. It's pre- so it's pretty massive. It's a very big part of what we do. Uh, for Guthrie, it's been a little less. A lot of it is direct, but I still sell half of my th- wine through distribution. Um, it's really important because um, that's how you get the wine in front of people. So, you know, someone in Iowa or Connecticut or Illinois, then they're, they're probably not going to hear about me unless they find my wine on a shelf somewhere or at a restaurant somewhere or something, you know, there's just so much wine out there. Um, so it's pretty important for brand building because that, you know, they pick my wine up on a shelf in Iowa they drink it, they like it, and then they come to my website and hopefully then they'll continue to buy direct from the website. But to be able to pick my website out of the ocean of websites <laughs> that wine, without, um, you know, big money behind you to do advertising, it's, yeah. Just, distribution is really where you anchor a small company to get it going. I've actually never asked you this. Why did you partner with Winestart when you did? My friend, Karen who has problems in wines. We're really good friends. We've worked together over the years and he was selling with him. He he was just telling me good things about it. Um, And then, so I I contacted Bob and never heard anything back, I think for like nine months. (laughs) That's the most Bob story I've ever heard. (laughs) Suddenly got back to me and he was like, oh, sorry, man, your your email got locked at the bottom of my pile of emails. I'd love to try all your wines. And then after a week, he was like, yeah, I'll take them. They're great, fantastic. (laughs) Um, but I actually think Weinster is an <laughs> awesome platform. I, I rep Weinster all the time because there's not many places where you can get this variety of hand-selected wines delivered to you. You know, like, like the, the wines that you guys have in your portfolio are no joke either. You know, there are a lot of the wines that I personally would go and search out and buy. And so to, for someone who is getting into wine or even a someone a full on sommelier would, would be happy getting wine delivered from wine store. I think, I mean, I, I tell a lot of people they're like, Oh, I want really like some wines. You know, they can go and join individual wine clubs from wineries, but, but why when you can go to wine store and get three different bottles or however many different bottles you want delivered every month, you know, you, you sell it better than I do. Good Lord. I think it's, it's um, a, if I wasn't a winemaker, I'd be part of it, but I get too much free wine. <laughs> That's real. Uh, can people come visit you and, and drink your wines as well as the wines you make? Yeah, so we have a tasting room. It's only for Stuart Cellars um, in Yonville. Um, so I don't have anywhere to really host for Guthrie Family Wines or anything. Um, although if I have a group of people that are super into it and want to reach out and really are out here and excited and want to come and taste the wine. Like I can usually make it happen. I can meet him at the winery or I could take him over to the Stuart Sellers taste room in Napa and, and taste them outside or something. Yeah. I can usually make it work. Eventually the goal is to have a tasting room. I think, you know, uh, Taylor and Ed. So uh, that again, you first grass. How do you become it's my favorite thing when I freeze. Um, there you go. You're back. We have a question. How do you, how, how do you become a full-time assistant intern? Um, so winery. So you go. want to be an intern. And um, uh, people, wineries are now putting out kind of calls for people to come and intern at a winery. Um, you don't really need any experience. You just need to know how to work your ass off, um, basically. So... As an intern, you just apply for a job. You don't need a background in it, um, but you need to make sure that you get across that you can work your butt off. And while I, when I say work your butt off, you're dragging hoses 12 hours a day. You know, you need, you, there, it's, you're not standing around chit-chatting. Um, I say it's, it's tough work. You need, you need to be tough. Um, but it's so gratifying. It's so awesome. When you're doing pump overs and punch downs, and if you're lucky, you'll, you'll end up interning at a winery with really passionate winemaker that's open about what he's doing and you can learn a huge amount. Um, 
I, I suggest doing it. If you're just into wine and you want to take a summer off of whatever you're doing, try and get an internship at a winery. It's so much fun. Uh, you have a great, and you got to remember also most wineries is usually like between three and 15 other interns doing exactly the same thing. And so you're all, you're all like, like you stink, you're wet and you're dragging hoses, but there's like, there's like six a year or, or eight a year and you're all miserable, but like you're miserable together and the music's blasting and this fermentation's going and there's, and it doesn't stop, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night and there's, forklifts flying around with lights and bins being dumped into ferments and it's so much fun i think you uh, just apply you go to winejobs.com or um i think traveling winemakers on facebook has a facebook page for advertising um yeah yeah we we need the label we don't have enough labor in the wine industry so if you're true. To work, come the last question of the night is from stacy uh and it's actually for both of us where do we see ourselves in 10 years? Uh, I'll answer briefly and leave it to you to, to close it out. Uh, I don't know where I see myself, but I, I damn sure hope that I'm still representing, selling, or and at least advocating for uh, the kind of brands and, and people that I get to do every day, because that's easily the best part of my job. Uh, answering 150 emails a day blows, but uh, getting to, to work with people like Blair and uh, all the, it's the best part of my job. It's the people that I get to uh, advocate for and the wine and the wines that they make. Uh, so I hope that I'm still doing something like that, or you know, retired because my wife just made it huge. That would be pretty cool too. Either one would work for me. How about you, um, Cabo? Nah, <laughs> I probably in the same, <laughs> probably uh, in the in the same place I am right now. I love what I'm doing. Um, I, I just hope maybe in 10 years that I'm further along in what I'm doing and have achieved, um, you know, a little more success. Um, I think I'll be doing the same thing I'm doing. I'm hoping that I'll just be making more wine and it will be more, a little bit more self-sustaining. Um, and I hope that we've cleaned up agriculture and we've cleaned up winemaking a little more. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much for submitting. We did about 50 questions. So this was absolutely awesome. We're doing this all over again on Tuesday night on the 28th. Uh, same time, uh, not the same place. Well, there will be a new link sent out. But um, we'll be in the same place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The same chair. And we'll be drinking the Chateau Guthrie GSM blend. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. I, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys have already um, cracked open your bottles. So thank you. And Blair, thanks, man. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And I'll see you on Tuesday night. Tuesday, we'll be back. All right. All right, guys. Thanks so much, let me, everybody. Let me, let me take an Instagram photo. Cracky, man. You need to put everyone on the screen. How do you get up, everyone up on the screen? I don't know how to do that with. Up on the top right. Can you, can you not do that?